how's that working for you? British Prime Minister Theresa May has appointed a Minister for Loneliness. Foothills Christian Church. I'm glad you are here today. If you're watching online for the first time, we're glad you are joining us in this series about intimacy and sexuality. So PG rating, you know, for everybody, just so you're welcome to have your kids in here with you. Uh, but uh, it's your choice, but you have to have the conversations with them about what all these things mean later. Okay, just saying. Uh, we're in this series because it's all about fulfilling your heart's desire it's about uh, discovering a wellspring of joy that overflows into every area of your life. And my appeal, the way that we're approaching this study is like we're doing every study this year because at the beginning of the year we said our goal is to expand the kingdom of God and, and, and package the way in which we do Bible studies uh, so that you could bring your friends who are unchurched or maybe unbelievers or even skeptical, uh, maybe on the fence, and we're going to present it in a way that they can kind of make up their own mind and decide for themselves. Uh, so if uh, you are a nominal follower, maybe you're unchurched, if you're watching for the first time, you're skeptical, but maybe you're really, you know, struggling with being alone and isolated. Uh, this series is for you. You may be a Christian who's struggling with confusion in your area of sexuality and so you have conflicting desires and drives, you're struggling with various temptations, you need answers. So in order for us to do all that, we've got to cut to the core, go to the root causes of all our confusion, our dissatisfaction, our unhappiness, our inability to walk and discover the, the fullness of joy that God has for us. If you want answers, uh, you got to realize in this situation, fluff is just not enough. You're going to have to put your thinking cap on. We're going to have to do some hardcore evaluation. We're going to have to go deeper to get the true answers. And one of the reasons why is because we live in a society that has been giving messaging to young people for now well over 20 years. And it's just resulting in a lot of heartbreaking things. And that is, is the inability to really find intimacy. I was looking at uh, just a little few videos about some young women who are in their 30s and, th you know, they've been told, oh, you don't need men, you're all, you're just fine, everything's great, you have this happy, fulfilled life, and they're finding out that it just wasn't true and it's heartbreaking for them. Let's watch. It's totally okay not to be married by 30. I'm in the Sahara Desert with 18 incredible women. About to go ride camels in the sunset. Um, I'm just having a really hard day and trying to get ready. That women tend to be happier when they are single. I could have married a lot of the people that I've dated. Okay, I turned 40 this year and I've never been in love. I've never been in a relationship. If you hear something or an update about your ex and it just kills you. Women tend to be happier, ha happier when they are single. Struggling financially. Being alone, having no one there to talk to as you age, you know, no kids. I always thought I would have kids. I thought I would be married by now. And now I, the closer I get to it and I'm scared. I don't, I don't know. I didn't think it would be an issue. I'm 32 years old. You know, these things are really heartbreaking. And what's interesting is our society is focused on sex and sexual fulfillment so much. Uh, that it's lost the capacity to develop intimacy. And in the end, that's what people are really searching for. So how in the world did something that God create, you know, he created sexual intimacy and he created these things uh, for spiritual intimacy. He created uh, two people becoming one flesh, uh, building these really healthy families and there's so much blessing and joy in all of this. How did something that God created become such a source of pain and suffering for so many people? Well, the short answer is secularism. Just write that down and go home, you're done. You know, why is that? Well, what our society has taught us to do is think, uh, focus on what we're thinking. You know, it's, uh, in the sexual realm, it works like this. It goes, well, 
wh- who am I sexually attracted to? How much do I, I want to have sex? How, this, so you're think- it's what you're thinking. Whereas in reality, the thing that drives our behavior, drives our core values, drives our convictions is how we think. And this is something that's not developed in schools anymore unless you do a classical education. And that is teaching you how to think about what you're thinking. And this is a very important thing, you know, a frame of reference. And that is because what you believe is one of the most important things about you. And what you believe is your frame of reference that helps you understand what you're thinking. And so this is so important because the pursuit of intimacy, uh, understanding your sexual dr- your se- that your sexual drives and desires are interconnected is a powerful frame of reference. Last week we talked about that and what our society has done is split them in two, right? There's spiritual and then there's physical. And by splitting them in two, it creates all this confusion. And what we talked about is that in the creation account, it shows how intimacy, the thirst of my soul, sexual drive and sexual intimacy are both very, very connected. And if you split them apart, it creates all this confusion. And if you're confused in one, let's say in the area of sexual intimacy or sexual practice, sexual desire, then your relationship with God is going to suffer. And if you're confused about your relationship with God, that always is expressed in sexual practice and sexual behavior. Uh, I've been the pastor here for 29 years, and I have had conversations on this topic with lots of different people in lots of different ways. And so I'm going to share them with you. I'm not going to tell you when I had them over the 29 years in order to protect the guilty. Um, a 20-year-old college student uh, 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 came to see me because his mom made him come to see me. He had gone he, in our youth group and then he'd gone off to college. He'd been there a couple years. He'd come back. And she was very concerned because he was very sexually active with a whole bunch of women. And so I was talking about it, and he says, well, look, bottom line, pastors, God made me with a really strong sex drive. So I think that, you know, prohibition is, was a cultural thing, you know. And besides, I'm not really sure I believe in God, I, you know. Um, you know, and if, he did, if I do, then he created me with this really healthy sex drive, and it's huge, and so I'm supposed to fulfill it. Another conversation. Well, we were married for 15 years. We had kids in high school, middle school, but sex was kind of boring between us. So we decided to go on one of those weekends, you know, where they mix couples, and we decided to open up our relationship. Because I just don't believe God intended us uh, to be satisfied with just one person sexually. Here's another conversation that I've had. You know, I really love my husband. I just don't want to have sex with him, ever. God made me with zero sex drive. I just don't need it. Here's another conversation that I've had. I know I was born with same-sex attraction. And so I've been this way since I was conscious. I know I was made this way. And why would God create me in a way that conflicts with the Bible's admonitions against that behavior, right? It's not fair that heterosexual people can be happy pursuing their sexual drives, and I can't, you know? Does God really want me to not be happy my entire life? Here's another conversation. We are not meant to be monogamous. It isn't in our nature. We're just not, you know. Here's another conversation I've had. I know I am a trans woman. I have known since I was three years old. I'm absolutely convinced this is how God made me. I was born in the wrong body. Here's another conversation. I've been divorced three times because each time I married the wrong person. And I'm sure that the right person is out there for me. And I hope one day I can find them. As you can tell as a pastor, you have a lot of really interesting conversations. (laughs) These are some things that have come to fruition that uh, recently, in probably the last five to eight years, that 
I haven't had direct conversations, but I've been a part of uh, uh, dialogue teams and research and things of that nature that, that where these things went on. And this is uh, one question that's been cropping up quite often today is uh, people who are in the LGBTQ plus community are debating, and that is how is a person's sexual attraction for children any different than a sexual attraction for a same-sex partner or heterosexual attraction? And so we're not going to call that pedophilia anymore. We're going to call it minor attracted persons. They're now called MAPs. Here's another one that's really come up, and it's this. I am a furry. And you're like, what in the world are you talking about? These are young people that uh, believe that they're cats or dogs or turtles or leopards or some type of animal. Uh, and so some of you might be thinking right now, okay, this pastor's off his rocker. What's he talking about? Da, 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 da. Well, all of these conversations that I just shared with you, if you have a 14-year-old with a phone, they've had these conversations in the last week. I guarantee it. Every one of the things I just mentioned are the top things that are happening on social media. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. This is the stuff that young people, the algorithms push to them all the time. They know exactly what I'm talking about. So, how in the world do we deal with that? Because every one of these conversations that I have had, every one of these things that I've researched, all have the exact same thing in common. And people are going to say, well, obviously it does with sex. I go, no. What they we all have in common is they reveal a person's definition of human nature. And this is the point where if you want answers to what's going on with your sexual desires, with your sexual temptations, or, or why it's unsatisfying in your marriage, or, you know, you have to, you can't start with, I'm going to focus on this, right, what I'm thinking. You have to take a step back, and most people never do this, and you have to start with your nature. And you have to define, what is my nature? Because once you define that, that tells you how to deal with and interpret and navigate all of this. So, in order to help you do that, I came up with a chart. Uh, I like graphics and illustrations and things of that nature. And this chart is really powerful because what it does is it basically shows you what the definitions of human nature are that are out there. And there's basically only three, okay? First one is Jewish, and this sounds strange, but Islamic, Latter-day Saints, and even Hinduism, which I just basically now covered every belief system out there other than Christianity, okay? So billions and billions of people hold to these. And what the, it is, if you were to ask a Jewish scholar, Islamic scholar, LDS, is that we have a dualistic nature. What that means is there are two of you. There's a good you and a bad you, and they're together. And the kind of an old illustration is this, is that, you know, you have a dog and you have a wolf inside of you, and whichever one you feed is what you're going to get, right? And so all of their, this is called religion, all of their uh, structure is to help you control the bad you, right, in order for you to be able to be the good you. Okay, in Judaism, you do this, you overcome the influence of the bad you by following the law and providing proper sacrifices and doing all this stuff. In Islam, you have to do the exact same thing, following the six pillars of the faith. You have to pray so many times, you got to uh, uh, do uh, all of these different things, right? What's really fascinating about Islam is that even if you do all that, in their teaching, there is no assurance, no promise of salvation or going to paradise at all. There's only one way, according to the Quran, that you can be assured that you will go to paradise, you know, which is their salvation. And does anybody know what that is? It's dying, in a, martyring yourself in a jihad. That is the only way that you can be guaranteed salvation. 
in Latter-day Saints, uh, they don't hold to the doctrine of hell. They hold to the doctrine of various levels of heaven. You have an earthly heaven, celestial kingdom, and the, these types of things. And that is you obtain the level of heaven determined by following the dictates of the faith. Because you have to control the nature of you that doesn't want to do the things that get you into higher levels of heaven. Okay? These are all, at their core, a definition of human nature that is dualistic. Dualistic ideology uh, was first articulated by Socrates and then Plato. This is 400 years before Christ was born. It's been around a long time. And the notion is, is that your spirit and your soul is one thing and your flesh and the fleshly desires are another thing. And then the, there's a complete separation between the two. Okay? And so dualism is you're both. Okay? You're a spiritual person. You are a fleshly person. Okay? Now, in secularism, this is the latest thing, and it didn't start until 1850. So this is only about 170 years old out of 7,000 years of recorded human history. And that is this is that this is secularism, atheism, scientific materialism. This is what is predominantly taught in schools today in America. And this is public school, this is private schools, this is charter schools, this is the top uh, philosophy of all Hollywood movies, media, uh, news organizations. This is the, the only today philosophy that is taught in universities today, unless you go to a very classical oriented university, okay? And that is this, everyone has one nature and it's inherently good, okay? All human beings are inherently good, we only have one nature. People sin or make mistakes because of systems. The reason people steal is because they're poor. And the reason they're poor is because the economic system creates poverty. Okay? The reason people, you know, the reason why you have all of the murder and you have all of the, the oppression in the inner city is because our system, our societal system created inner cities and those people then are conditioned to do that, okay? If therefore the way you change behavior is you change the system. And if you can find the perfect system, you're going to produce, right, a perfect society. So this is the, the philosophical basis of describing or defining human nature in which the, the concept of utopia exists. The outflow of this is if you consider something wrong or sinful, you're the problem because there is no inherent sin in human nature. This is the whole notion of you can't judge me. Stop judging. You know, if you judge, there, you're the devil. Though we don't believe in the devil, you are the devil because you judge. Um, and the, the bottom line on this is you know, stop judging people who steal, right? Because it's your fault that you're a part of a system that propagates poverty and poverty is a cause of all theft. That this is their reason, okay? Now, what a lot of people don't understand is that this is Marxist philosophy. Most people make the mistake because they think that Marxism is a political and economic system. It is not. It is 100% a religious philosophy because everything that he postulates is built on the foundation of a definition of human nature. And you know what that definition of human nature is? People are inherently good. It's systems that make them bad. Okay? Now, this represents everybody in the world from atheists to every other belief system other than Christianity, which is, in their eyes, weird. But this is what Christianity teaches. It's called Christian orthodoxy. I don't mean the Orthodox Church. What I mean is orthodoxy, and that is, has been the core 
foundation of the definition of human beings for 2,000 years in Christianity, and it's never changed. And that is, is that you were created in the image of God. Therefore, your, uh, a lot of things about what you desire in life, you dream about in life, come out of your soul that is created in the image of God. You have high value because you're created in the image of God. But guess what? Your nature has been tainted by sin simply because you were born into this world. Now, how you get that way, there's debates. But the bottom line is everybody is tainted by sin. And this sin corrupts everything. It corrupts everything. Now, it doesn't mean that you have less value. It just means that your drives and your desires, you can't really trust them. Okay, And the reason Jesus came was to redeem you and cleanse you from the power or the grip of sin in your life. So Jesus came in order for you to do what? Restore and heal your soul and break the power of sin. That doesn't mean you won't sin again, but what it does mean is that the power of sin and its influence over you can be broken. And so you can overcome and be free of anything in your life. This to me, uh, the reason I love this and I'm biased, I'll tell you right up front, is because this is the most Uh, loving of human beings and the most hopeful for human beings out of anything else. Because what this says is that it doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter what your background was, how toxic you're, you're, you're bringing up, it doesn't matter how much violence or trauma that happened to you, how many patterns and proclivities that were imprinted upon the neural pathways of your brain, that you, uh, because when Jesus Christ died for you and you come to belief in him and you are now redeemed by him and restored by him, it has the power to break everything, including death. That's it. So I'm like, that's what it's all about. And some people are like, well, why are we talking about this? I thought this was going to be a thing on sex. Well, the reason I'm telling you this is because of this next chart. This next chart is every passage in the Bible that deals directly with your sexuality. And what I mean, it says, Basically, your nature and sexuality. In Genesis chapter 126, created in the image of God, uh, go be fruitful and multiply. We talked last week. What does be fruitful and multiply mean? Yeah, have sex and have children, you know. And so you go through this, you go even through the law in Leviticus, you go through Deuteronomy, you go through Judges. When you read Judges chapter 16, the story of Samson and Delilah, you read it, Delilah, you read it over and over again. And what you come to understand is Samson was the most powerful person in all of Israel as a judge, but he had one problem, and it was sexual in nature across the board. In sexual, his sexual drive destroyed him. Okay? You could read about David and Bathsheba. You can read, you know, you read Psalms 51, you read Proverbs 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and you start reading those and you go, wow, man, I, this, this uh, sexual stuff is really dangerous. I should stay away from it, from it. And you start going down that road and suddenly you get the brake slammed on you because boom, Song of Solomon, because that doesn't have a lot of negative things to say about sexual intimacy. <laughs> Just saying. It's like, wow, this sounds like fun. And you're right. You can you can read through the prophets. What's interesting, if I were to include not just the direct references, but every story in the Old Testament, every incident in the Old Testament that had sex or sexuality as a part of the story integral, you would read two thirds of the Old Testament, right? New Testament, Matthew. Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Mark. These are passages directly related to sexuality, marriage, having children, family, all the way down here. You just keep going and going and going all the way through the book of Revelation. There are well over 100 passages of scripture directly dealing with your sexuality. If we were to include, like I said before, everything that has it a part of the story, there'd be over a thousand passages of scripture. And the reason why we're so confused, because we live in a deconstructionist society today, and so what they do is they take one verse out of one place and they say, well, this is not what it really meant. And you have to understand they deconstruct it because they basically say, if I can find one flaw here, I can throw out the whole thing. But the reason I'm pointing this out is that all of these verses 
must be read in context. To understand, you know, 1 Peter 2.11, I need to read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and Genesis 17 and Genesis 19. And I need to read that. And then I can come over here and read 1 Peter 2.1. And then I can read all these other passages. And the more I read all of them, I start to get this beautiful picture, this tapestry of what it actually means and what my nature and my sexual identity, my sexual uh, desires have to do with my relationship with God. And what you see in this tapestry, right, this overarching clarity is that it has the power to take a couple, and a man and a woman, and bind them together as one flesh. It has the power to build people, a man and a woman, into soul mates. It has the power to smooth over flaws and imperfections in the relationship. It has the power to connect two people on a physical, emotional, and spiritual level. Most importantly, it is the greatest power of all in that it can create life. Nothing else can create life. Like, like for instance, let's, let me... What you need to understand and what I'm trying to get you to think about is this. Your frame of reference, your definition of humanity is what determines how you understand the biblical specifics about sexual involvement. Uh, case in point, let's read 1 Corinthians 6 down there which is part of that list, okay? Before I read it, I want you to understand the context, okay? Paul is writing the church in Corinth. Corinth at this time is in modern-day Greek, uh, Greece. It's right there on the little isthmus right there. Uh, I always have to say that word right. And that is, it's the shortest land distance there. They've actually cut a big channel through it today. Uh, it was known prior to the church being planted is it was a center for uh, uh, the worship of Diana, which was a fertility cult. And there they, they had a very uh, uh, active fertility cult. What you would do is you'd serve in the temple. And what you would do is they would dye your hair. They'd cut your hair, dye your hair. Sometimes they'd shave your head. And what that you would do is you would wear these diaphanous things. They didn't know if you were male or female. And then you would go to the temple and your form of worship was to have sexual intercourse with this person serving, okay? And then you would pay a uh, offering, right? So, so it's like a spiritualization of a, a brothel, basically. But that's how it worked. And so... What's interesting is that a lot of those people have become followers of Christ and now they're part of the church and that's how you understand the whole passage in there about having your head uncovered or shaved and all that kind of stuff, okay? But what's really interesting in chapter 5 is he starts off by saying this, it is actually reported there is immorality among you, immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among non-believing Gentiles. So he starts off, he says, in the church you've got a guy who is sleeping with, having sex with his dad's wife. You're like, wow. Then he talks about, okay, this is why that's a problem for the rest of the chapter. Then in chapter 6, he goes right into, look, the other thing is, you, you guys have a case against one another in the church, and you're suing each other. And he talks about how when you do this, you're asking someone outside the church to settle your dispute. And what you're doing is you're saying, well, this person offended me in the church, so I'm going to sue them. So then you come in with get guns blazing, and you end up being the one who is abusing them. So it's kind of like a form of lawfare, right? And so he starts then, and he picks it up in verse 7. If you're doing this, I want you to know actually then, there it's on the screen, it's already a defeat for you. So he's saying you've already defeated when you take that route. Because you have lawsuits with one another. It would be better, you know, to just be wronged. Why not rather be wronged, he says. Why not rather be defrauded? It'd be, he says the route you're going down is so bad, he goes, it'd be better to just be defrauded than go that direction. He goes, on the contrary, because you end up yourselves doing the wrong and defrauding. And you're doing it to your brothers in Christ. Do you not know? So he just said that, all right? about lawsuits, and then he says, do you not know 
that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, right? But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will do away with both of them. Your body is not for immorality it is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. You notice what he said there, there? This is very important to understand. What he said is, your spirit and your body are together. They are not separate. Because what they were doing is they were saying, well, God has saved me and my soul is set. It's going to heaven. I'm doing great. But my body, you know, my body is flesh. It's bad. It's evil. I'm not my body. And so my body wants to go up to the temple and have a good time. Go for it. Now, how do I know that's what he's saying? Because listen to what he says next. Not only has God raised the Lord, but will also raise us meaning our bodies as well as spirits, up through his power. Do you know that your bodies, so he's talking about your fleshly body, is a member of Jesus. It's not just your soul, it's your body too. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? He's talking about the temple prostitutes. He says, may it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body. See, he's talking about your body. But notice how your body and what you do with your body has a massive impact on your soul. See, look at what he says. He goes, do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? And then last week we taught on this passage and Paul quotes from it. He says, the two will become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is now one spirit with him and one body. The body now belongs to the Lord. Flee immorality. Flee it. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. You shouldn't steal from that person because it really hurts that person, right? Okay? But the immoral man sins against himself. It's so bad for you. It's so bad for you. And then you make a video about how everything you were told has destroyed your life. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? I hear this all the time. My body is a temple. You know, you know where I hear it? I hear it at the gym all the time. Right? People go to the gym. They go, well, man, I'm, I'm, I'm putting in the work, man, because my body is a temple. And they always talk about nutrition, you know. Well, are you a vegan? I'm, I'm a vegetarian. Why? Because the body is a temple. You know, my diet, it's all about my body is a temple. I don't drink alcohol because my body is a temple. But I've never heard one person ever say, I'm abstaining from any type of sexual immorality because my body is a temple. Never heard that. But that's exactly what he's saying. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? I'm driving this point home because I, can't, I do not want it to be missed in any way, shape, or form. I want it to be so clear that you're not, he just doesn't redeem your spirit, your soul, but your body as well. They are together. They're intimately connected. He goes, you are not your own. You don't belong to you when you've given your life to Christ. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. How? In your body. Now, what's really interesting about this, I think, is that your frame of reference 
is going to tell you how to interpret this, okay? Your frame of reference is going to communicate to you how to think about it, how it will dictate your conclusions, okay? First and foremost, uh, if you have a Jewish, a LDS, a uh, Hindu or an Islamic frame of reference, what you're going to do is you're going to basically say it is a win-lose proposition, right? It's win-lose. And that basically means this. I need to stay pure, right? I need to stay pure. And if I have a temptation and I succumb to it, uh, if I fall over here and I follow the bad part of me, then the bad part is one, and now I'm forever tainted for the rest of my life. And this is, I see oftentimes young people who are followers of Christ kind of view their nature this way. And so they say, man, temptation has got me. I can't break this temptation. It's just got me so, you know, in its grasp, and I, I don't know how to get out of it. And so what they do is they get locked in this pattern of guilt and shame about what they are attempt, they're being tempted to do. But the way you solve the temptation and the way you get stronger is not fighting the desire, it's filling the spirit. And the more you work on the thirst of your soul in meeting the needs of the thirst of your soul, guess what happens? The stronger you get about all of those things. Because why? Your frame of reference determines how you understand these. Now, if you are a secular humanist or you're an atheist or whatever, what you do is you say, this is a bunch of outdated garbage. You know, this, this was written to a culture that didn't understand what the real nature of human beings are like. Because our nature is good. Our nature is not sinful. Th therefore, you can say to yourself that any type of sexual attraction you have is good. So you can have... You know, any type, you can have uh, multiple sex partners, you can have gay sex, you can have le uh, uh, lesbian sex, you can have furry sex, you can have transgendered sex, you can be queer, you can be transgendered, you can, be all, you can pursue any of these sexual things. And the reason why is because your nature is good, and if your nature is good, anything that you're attracted to has to be normal. It has to be. Okay? And so that to me is why they get to where they get. But what I think is really fascinating, and I just I want to make sure I read this just right, okay, is that your nature, since it's good, the only reason that you're suffering anxiety, depression, higher rates of suicide, higher rates of drug abuse, higher rates of isolation is because not of your sexual behavior, because this community that practices these things has much higher rates of these mental uh, health issues. It says it's not because there's anything wrong with your desire. It's because society is judging you. The problem with that is modern research is proving this to be false because in nations where it has been widely accepted for over 50 years, the rates of anxiety, depression, suicide, uh, drug abuse, all of these types of things is at the same level or higher. So it's not a synopsis. It has nothing to do with the fact that your behavior is running, is running counter to the thirst of your soul. That's what secular humanists would say. However, if you hold to Christianity's definition of human nature, what you see is this. My drives come out of being created in the image of God, but my desires and attractions have been tainted, so I can't always trust them. Can I? I can't trust them. You see? Because... If I participate in them, then what ends up happening is I go down a path, 
right? Where the world can manipulate me and use my drives against me. And that is the challenge. The primary way that these things are used against me is when I fulfill the desire of my heart in the wrong way. And it results in a wounding and a hurting of my soul that's reflected in my body. It drives me farther away from God. The one thing my soul needs to be at peace. First, I'm designed to be intimate with God. Secondly, intimate with others. If I choose to pursue these things, I ultimately end up far from God. I miss out on the inheritance and the blessing of being in his kingdom. And that's the point of verse 11, chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, where he says, Do you not know, in verse 10, that these people going down this path never inherit the kingdom of God? Right? In other words, they're going in a direction that fuels the taint and drives them away from God. He says, what you want to do is you want to be driven towards God. And that's the point of verse 11. He says, some of you used to be this way. And so we know that, wow, I can turn at any moment from any of these things and turn back to God and be washed and sanctified. If there is one gift I could give you today, it is to think deeply about your sex drive. Think about it. This is the primary way in which you can be manipulated by this world and miss out on the intimacy that God has intended for you, first with him and then with another person. Think about it and think about what do I believe about my nature? See, If you are a young male or female struggling with temptation, the way to strengthen yourself is to understand your nature and to focus on meeting the needs of your soul. That young man in his 20s, a couple years later, he went on a mission trip. When he came back, he said, I need to talk to you. He said, man, this thing just rocked my world. He said, just rock my world. He said, I've never seen such abject poverty and people living in such squalor and, and no access to anything, so, such hopeless lives. And I saw churches, people coming together, worshiping and just such purity and such joy. They, they had a, a love for God that I didn't have. I goes, he said, I have everything in the world. I don't have, they have nothing. And man, but they, they, they have such a purity of love for God. And I long for that. And he goes, but you know what the weirdest thing was? I was gone for two weeks. I didn't think about sex once. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Maybe there's something going. Maybe you thought your nature isn't what you thought it was. The wife who said she had no sex drive and it condemned her husband to a a sexless marriage, she had broken covenant with him and she would not admit it. In therapy, she heard a lot of really uncomfortable truths because through a course of events she had to go, she went. And what she found out is that she was basically a perfectionist and her perfectionist had made her a keeper of accounts. So she had a lot of resentment. First, she had resentment with her parents. She resented her parents. She resented her siblings, all the different siblings, you know. And then she resented uh, her coworkers. She resents her friends. She resents her own kids. And she especially resents her husband. But she heard these uncomfortable truths. She dealt with these things in her life. She turned back to God. She found healing in his name. And she said, it wasn't until I realized that my perfectionism and all the resentment in my life had become my idol. This sounds weird, but it was the thing I thought about all the time. It was the thing I fed. I tithed to it. I threw gas on that flame. I built it into this idol, and it affected every other area of my life, mostly sexually. And then I finally re- gave it to God. I went through this healing process, and now my husband walks around church with a smile on his face. Why? Because they're being intimate? No, because they're keeping covenant. They're keeping covenant. That's so much more powerful. This is Rosaria Butterfield. And the thing that I am interested about her is, well, let me, let me tell you about 
her real quick. Let me read her little vitae, and that is this. She was raised and educated in a liberal Catholic setting. She loved books and philosophy. In her late 20s, she was allured by feminist philosophy and LGBT BTQ plus politics, so she adopted a lesbian identity and took a lover. She earned her PhD from Ohio State University in 1992 and then served in the English Department and Women's Studies program from 92 to 2002, earning tenure in 1999. Her primary academic field was critical theory. If you listen to the Salty Pastor, you know what I think about that. Specializing in queer theory. In 1997, while Rosario was searching the religious right for a new book because she wanted to write a book about their politics of hatred against people like me, she met Ken and Floyd Smith. He was an older Presbyterian minister, and they actually just decided to invite her to dinner. Over the ensuing years, eventually she read the Bible with a different lens. She gave her life to Jesus. She got married. She's now a mother and grandmother, and her husband is a pastor of a church. Isn't that interesting? You see, as long as she had the secular framework of this is my nature, it wasn't until she shifted over here that she didn't try to force herself into something. It just happened naturally. Are you, a, are you a married couple and you want to raise really healthy children into strong adults? Do you want them to be able to have the right type of understanding of how to navigate this highly sexually uh, obsessed and saturated culture? Then the best thing that you can do is work on your own marriage. And the best way to do that is to have a strong intimate marriage. You know how you know that you're having an impact on your kids? In a, in, because things are caught, not taught, right? You know that you're exemplifying this to your children when they become young teenagers and they start going, ew, will you quit doing that? Oh, that's so gross. Oh, my parents. Oh, I can't even imagine that, you know? They start doing that, then you know you're doing a good job, right? The more of that, yeah, you want, let's get more of that negative feedback because they can complain about it and whine about it. But deep down inside, what you're saying is that this is what real life, real intimacy looks like. And it's the best thing ever. I was kind of shocked because uh, I wrote this book, you know, to say this is for married couples, married couples only, but help you develop these skills because a lot of married couples just don't have skills on how to love each other, you know, because our world doesn't model it. So I, I wrote that. I said, hey, you could do it. We sold half of them on the first Sunday. There's still more out there at the coffee bar if you want. If you're watching online, they're on Amazon. Just uh, look up the name and my uh, name or there you go. It's right there. So boom. If you, Amazon, it's like 13 bucks, but here on campus, uh, it's 10 bucks. So if you want to use that, please do. The things we're talking about are really deep. They're hard to think about, but they have the power to set you free. Let's stand for closing prayer. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Uh, if Sean's testimony earlier today touched your heart, if you said, you know what, I really want to get connected, I want to grow my faith, I want to be on fire for Jesus like he is, one of the best ways you can do that is just go out and visit the Connection Point booth. They have all the small groups you can get plugged into, all the service opportunities, upcoming events, all that stuff. If you are not on campus, we have a QR code that you can scan that has a lot of that same information, but you need to be plugged in. And especially as we head into summer, it's really easy to disconnect. And that's the exact opposite of what you want to do if you're trying to grow your faith. So make sure you get connected. Um, if you need prayer, the elders will be up here to pray with you after service. But until then, let's do a closing prayer and I'll see you guys soon. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for um, the amazing message that Pastor Doug shared with us. We thank you for the joy of intimacy um, in its truest form, which involves you, Lord. We thank you for everyone that's here on campus and watching online that we would all travel safely out of here today and spread your gospel as we go. We pray all these things in your son's heavenly name. Amen. Have a good week.